Excellent. How are you all? Yeah. Happy? Yeah. Really happy? Yeah. Yeah. Middlingly happy? <laughs> bit fucked off. <laughs> Anyone a bit fucked off? Brilliant. That's brilliant, isn't it? You can wake up in the morning and not be a bit fucked off. No, I, think it's, uh, I think it's weird. I'm a bit of a swearer. I hope that's okay. It's too late. I am a real swearer. Um, and I've, I've got a clip. This is in case it triggers anybody. I've got a clip in here where someone uses the C word and I, I'm apologising for that in advance. Okay, It's not my use, but you'll, you'll understand why, why it's in there um, soon. Oh, that's my necklace. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hippies. <laughs> <laughs> the chakra one bothering it. Really. So um, I'm going to take you through um, a talk. I'm going to take you through some music. I'm going to use music to illustrate kindness um, and actually a lack of kindness sometimes as well. Um, I'm a bit of a mover, i.e. I don't stand still. Sorry, guys. Um, and, um, and I'm really happy to be interrupted and challenged as we go. I'll, we'll have a fight, I'll win, but I'm really happy. Like, we go through the paces, it's just training for me. All right, but before I start, I always start every single talk the same way. So I want to start with a sing song. I'm looking for a big, big voice. Big voice in the room. Anyone? Is it me you're looking for? No? no. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I've got four kids, I'm quite old now, I'm 50, and um, my children, uh, in fact, yeah, I'll tell you a bit about Daisy in a minute, but my children, um, they've seen this, this introduction many times, and they say the same thing each time. Your cultural references are getting old, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> you need to bring them up to date, Dad. And so I thought I'd bring them up to date, and um, another song that begins with hello, anybody here from the 1980s? Some of you. It's just, it's just a fucking playlist, isn't it? Some of you. Whereas in the 1980s, there was this thing called Acid House, which followed a thing called Chicago House. In the 1980s, um, I went to university. I, I, I was paid, just think about this. I was paid to go to university. £2,100 a year, £700 a term, and I got housing benefit. So I was in Bradford, so fucking cheap in Bradford at the time. I was paying £16 a week rent, and I was getting £4 a week back from the council. <laughs> Just think about that. It's <laughs> amazing. And I DJ because I was short of money. Unbelievable. <laughs> and there was a band called The Beloved. Do you remember The Beloved? Yeah. yeah. So I got a little bit of The Beloved. It's a hello. And normally at this point, and then leap forward to 1995 and put some Oasis in, the singing plasterers. But I decided, I can't listen to it anymore. Just can't. And you're all waiting for the obvious one, aren't you? You're all waiting for the big one, aren't you? Where am I headed now? Yes, music for old people. <laughs> She's brilliant, right? I know she's brilliant. But, but when she can unify both my parents and my children, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. So growing up, I loved blues and I loved early rock and roll, which was just rhythm and blues. And I loved bluegrass, you mentioned it earlier. And I loved jazz, and so did my granddad. But I went to his music. When my parents turn up in their car and say, we've discovered this new singer, this was just after 21 was released, it's not much of a discovery, she's called Adele. Yeah, I know, she, I know who she is. She's the future, they tell me. <laughs> she isn't, because you like her. <laughs> so, hello. I'm Mark. And I, I want to look at why kindness matters. I want to look at why it's important to business. I want to look at why... For a long time, we felt we can leave our morals in a bag at the door and then swipe in with our lanyard and pick them up on the way back out again. And why that's okay. And why it actually is not fucking okay. So how we've got to change. And I want to talk about language as well. And the first time I gave, <coughs> this is the second time I've given this themes presentation. The presentation changes. But um, it's the second time I've given it. And I gave it first at the Good Life Experience last September. And it was such an emotional experience, because I kind of give a lot of myself in this. Because I've not always been a nice man. Uh, I've not been a sod either, but I've not always been 
she's a nice man. But the night before, um, I have a proper moment there, my daughter told me she was pregnant. It was like one of those fuck moments. I was sat in the studio, typing furiously, always type faster when the deadline approaches. And she walked in and went, Dad, I've got something to tell you. I went, she's 25, by the way, she's not 15. <laughs> I just get that out of the way really quickly. And she said, that she burst into tears, and I went, oh, you're pregnant? And she went, yeah, I'm really sorry, don't tell me off. Oh, oh, tell you off. It's going to be great, big hug, gorgeousness, everything's great. You stay here this weekend, you get your boyfriend up, tell him first. Get your boyfriend up. <laughs> His parents live up the road, you can have a chat, we'll go to the festival. Don't worry about it, everything's going to be great. She leaves the room and I did that classic thing where I went, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> I am not ready for this right now. This is not fitting my life right now. I can't be the disruptor that goes into businesses and be a granddad. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, of course you can. That's the whole point. And it took me, you know, my ego was, it, I haven't got a particularly big ego, big ego. I just know what I'm really good at. That's not having an ego, by the way. That's just knowing what you're really good at. But it took two weeks for my ego to get back in its box and say, it's, it's okay. You can still do the things that you want to do. So I gave this presentation, uh, so a similar presentation, how the good life experience, and I, was, and I couldn't, we couldn't tell anyone. So we turned up late because we were properly emotionally distressed. <laughs> and um, could barely fucking focus. And uh, Charlie, who was a good life experience, came up to me and said, Are you all right? And I went, not really, no. I a bit of a moment. And he said, what's up? I said, I can't tell you. We're not allowed to tell you until whatever, 12 weeks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I can't tell you, but when I do, when I can, I'll do. And, um, and my wife couldn't watch me because she knew this was a new talk and she knew it was kind of an emotional thing. Apparently I've done my exercise for the day. Um, and, um, and, and I gave this talk and, it, and there was about 3,000 3, people in the tent. It was ridiculous. I was in tears the entire way. So... It might happen again. <laughs> if I cry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it could easily, easily happen again. But as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm 50 and I've been working in business now for uh, 29 years. And when I look back at some of the language that's used in business, it's so problematic. And I get called a snowflake and that's okay. I, I, don't, I don't mind being called a snowflake. Being a snowflake means standing up for what's right. I'll, I'll be a snowflake. I don't care. But when you look at some of the language, and like this, this is stuff I've heard in the last month. Man up, tough at the top. Yeah, but this is business. And you can put, yeah, ethics are nice, but this is business. You can put whatever you want in there. I'm not here to make friends. If you can't stand the heat, all's fair in love of business, toughen up princess. Fucking hell. <laughs> it's a really good friend of mine who said that. We need to be mercenary. That was probably my best friend who said that to me about a year ago. Not my best friend anymore. <laughs> but enough. Let's throw them under the bus, somebody else said. I just threw them under the bus. But the language that we use in business is really unpleasant. And what we've done, we've taken the playground and we put it into business. And then we complete the loop by putting business on TV and informing the playground. So if you look at how this is working out for us, I put together a few clips from The Apprentice. Such a dreadful show. Something that you didn't call any book, antique dealer, Tommy. Have you ever said something first? Yes, exactly. You haven't done anything first, have you, Richard? This full step. Oh, you're just, you're just, you're just marginally worse than them. So I'm not getting on it. I, I actually see. Yeah. Have you come across him as a bit of a control freak? Yes. And that what you're saying, the outside is both true. Okay. Look, I think I've had enough. pounds worth. It's a hundred and ten pounds difference. Well, Look. if you can't be bothered to go and get your book, Paul, and you can't. Be for you. Don't you I am that. here for you. I have enough of rowing today because you seem to think you can do everything right when in fact you do exactly the same thing as everybody else. My, side, my problem is you. Don't be here. Sure. I'm telling oh, you, you. Let's get you quiet like you always do. You're not making sense. You're not making sense. Question. 
lost. We've lost. We've lost. Yeah, on your cell. What in the f***ing our cell? Listen. No, 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 no. Listen, you're really f***ing. I don't know why I've got a bleeping mic, so I'm going to show you something much worse next. And, you know, this is the leading business programme in the UK. This is a real problem. And I've, I've had a long history of working with businesses. I've worked with some of the biggest businesses on the planet. I've worked with the ones that aren't necessarily that good. You know, I've worked with, <coughs> I've worked with Amazon, I've worked with Coca-Cola, I've worked with Google, I've worked with Samsung. And I've worked with them on, on sustainability, and I've worked with them on purpose, and I've worked with them on good things. But I can't ignore the fact that over there, there's maybe not some good things going on. I, I know that. I had to make a decision a few years ago because I had no work. And Patagonia didn't need me. I had to go and work with people who don't like who I don't like. It was a tough decision, but I had no cash, and I was sat in a camper van in Margate crying, thinking, I can't even afford to go to the cinema with my kids, it's just my wife in there with them, I need to sort something out. So I had to work with people that don't like me, and that's a hard compromise. But I only work on projects that are good. And that's an easy compromise to make. When you're trying to shift a big tanker around, you've got to start somewhere. More, more of that, that later. But this, this, this layer of unpleasantness, it's endemic, and it isn't just in business. If you read the bottom half of the internet, it's utterly vile. Now, I'm a massive fan of Stuart Lee, comedian, metropolitan liberal elite, left-winger. It's clearly the same age as me, grew up in the Midlands, near me. Obviously, um, I'm going to like him. And he had no social media presence. And about six years ago, he was alerted to the fact that although we had no social media presence, he appeared on social media a fair bit. So he now does a whole skit where he goes through what people have said about him on social media. Jazz music and the Martin Chan truth. Rowan Wrong on the Guardian's Communist Free Site calls me a sneering tosser. <laughs> Tokyo Fist on YouTube writes, smug elitist liberalism, who is this cunt? <laughs> Warto15 on Twitter writes, I hate Stuart Lee with a passion. He's like Ian Huntley to me. <laughs> Huey on YouTube says, Stuart Lee, I will shove my thick cock in your throat, you gay lord. <laughs> Z Factor on Twitter writes, Stuart Lee addresses an insular cadre of socially challenged, prematurely middle-aged, shooter intellectual men. <laughs> I, I know, yeah. <laughs> Not as exclusively as I'd like to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> right, it'll just be us again soon. Right, right. We can't last. We're back to one night and then you're all right. Uh, Apudabaya writes, I spent the entire show thinking of how much I want to punch you and me in his face. The fucking smug face cunt. <laughs> And that's on a website that is actually called beexcellenttoeachother.com. <laughs> but Jimmy Vesco on don'tstartmeoff.com writes, a shit-haired cunt <laughs> who resides at the very apex of all that is absolute patience-testing way. <laughs> Seriously, when there is the comedy equivalent of the Nuremberg Trials, this bastard is going to be hung from the highest fucking lamppost, <laughs> pelted with wasps' nests and dog turns, <laughs> and eventually blasted with a flamethrower. <coughs> fucking hell, he concludes. I can't put into words. <laughs> I'm going to leave it there. It goes on. It's a genius. And as soon as you say out aloud the nastiness that is written, it kind of takes the pain away. 
There's that bit in, um, oh, well, obviously, the whole premise of, Lo of uh, Lord of the Rings, bloody hell. Harry Potter is you don't say the word Lord Voldemort. <coughs> you should, and you give it more power. And, and what happened in New Zealand was, was responded to by the Prime Minister beautifully. Then, then she refused to say his name. And I kind of felt that that was a mistake. I, I, I'm not, it, she's been, I can't criticise her, she's fucking astonishing. <laughs> However, like, don't give it more power. And, and I kind of think, well, when you say it out, you take its power away. And there's a series of really beautiful sketches on YouTube where um, nasty confrontations on, on the internet are spoken between two ageing academics. And it's just lovely. Mm -hmm. it, it, it takes all of the heat out of it. So we live in a world where nastiness, um, unkindness, has become, I, I'd say, like n normal, or, or at least it's become sport for some people. And it's become the perceived way that you behave in certain environments, and, and, and business is one of those environments. And I genuinely believe that enterprise is the answer to so many of our problems. I genuinely believe it created so many of our problems too. But I, I think enterprise is a good thing, not a bad thing. And it's just been doing, it's been answering the wrong brief for like 100 years. And now everything's changing. Extinction Rebellion is just the best thing that's happened in terms of sustainability in the last 20 years. I absolutely love it. And I was on Waterloo Bridge. Go into a meeting, I'm not going to say I was part of it or I wasn't, I was walking through but thinking, fuck yes, we, we, we need more of this. And, and I've grown up in, in, in disruptive times, this is me aged about, I don't know, five, six? But that was a photographer, so we've got some great photographs of me and my brother as kids. <coughs> and I'm only going to show you one, and that's one. But I've put together my career highlights into a series of slides, so I'm going to talk you through them. And I'm going to talk about kindness as I go. And I'm going to talk about where it was and where it wasn't. Um, and as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm old. I grew up in the 1970s. Remember the 1970s? Yeah, some of you. Musically, nearly perfect decade, actually. Nearly perfect. Um, anything that sort of starts with the end of the Beatles and ends with the start of disco or punk. Got a bit lost in the middle with prog rock, <laughs> but but I'll forgive that. I bet you like a bit of prog rock, actually, don't you? I can imagine that. Um, <laughs> so I've got all my career highlights here, and I'm going to start with this strike, 1976. Something like what 1976 sounded like. Sounds a bit like it. Right? Maybe pop, that's for life, right? So where was I in 1976? I was at school in um, in Sharnford in Leicestershire. A little Church of England primary school in the 1970s were famous for two things. Well, they're famous for more than that, but they're mainly famous for two things. First, industrial action. Everybody was on strike. Three day weeks, normal. Now, what sits behind a strike is the desire to change something for the better. There's goodness, there's kindness behind a strike. What happens with some unions at that time? Was they became about control and power, and the, and the kindness evaporated. That's not un uniform. Un un unions are really strong, powerful things. But in the 1970s, my granddad worked for British Leyland, and uh, sorry, for Triumph Motorbikes, and um, some of the stories he told me were hair raising. This was about political gain for one or two individuals, often. And the other thing that the Britain was famous for in the 1970s um, was really shit food, like the fucking worst food ever. <laughs> Crispy pancakes. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, oh yeah. <laughs> Crispy pancakes, I remember those. Primula cheese spreads. <laughs> Just think about that. <laughs> Just think about that for a minute. Cheese, it's not really cheese. I know what it's made of, I've been in a factory. In a tube mm. with chopped up prawns in it. <laughs> yeah. They had to, to make it look appealing. They had to give you a piercing cap that was ziggy zaggy. So when you squirted it, you got a ziggy 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 ziggy, ziggy, ziggy zaggy edge. I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. Right? You had a ziggy zaggy edge to go with your ziggy zaggy cut tomatoes. That was the height of hot cuisine in the home in the 1970s. And I wanted a bit of this shit food at school because we ate cooked dinners. We ate food that the dinner ladies had cooked. Vitamins, minerals, admittedly most of the cauliflower was pink, it had been boiled for at least an hour. The cabbage was limp, it had been boiled for at least an hour. 
And I, and, I, and I felt I needed a little bit more 1970s excitement. I wanted rise and shine rather than orange juice. Some of you are thinking, what the fuck is rise and shine? <laughs> Let me tell you what rise and shine is. You take orange juice, perfectly good orange juice, and you boil it. You boil it until it evaporates to a slurry. You freeze dry it. You add sugar to it. You realise you've taken all the vitamins out of it, so you add a few more back in. Put it in a packet. Convenient orange juice. There's nothing more convenient than squeezing an orange, trust me. And then you put this into a glass and you whisk it up and it never dissolves. You always end up choking on the dry bit. That was what we drank in the 1970s. I'm not joking. So I wanted a bit of that at school. <coughs> so I took the school out on strike. I was nine. And um, we marched up and down the playground for three hours and we had we had placards down with dinners, we want sandwiches. And, um, <laughs> serious, serious. I can't believe I had, the, I had the confidence to do this back then. And um, after three hours, we were told, we'll, we will consider your request. And um, at the end of the day, just before we went home, we were told, you can bring sandwiches for dinners now. Um, in, in, within a few weeks, we'll, we'll, you, you get the option. So I went home that night, and I said to my mum, because you didn't quite tell your mum everything. My mum knows fuck all about it on this slide, actually. She knows that bit really well, because that's the bit she can tell everyone about. Um, but she doesn't really know much of the other stuff. And I told my mum, hey mum, um, there's been this thing at school, and as a result, we're allowed to bring sandwiches for dinner. And my mum rightly said, well, Mark, some people, some people would be bringing sandwiches. I mean, your dad both work, you have sometimes have sandwiches for your tea you're going to be having a hot dinner every day and it's going to be a school. <laughs> <laughs> so day one of the new regime, I'm stood at the front of the queue, and all my mates, <laughs> that symbol, right? And, and you're the nice dinner, you're Mrs. Thomas, right? I'll feed you your lines. Mm -hmm. okay. Thomas, can you say to me, I'm glad you're still with us, Mark. Yes, <laughs> <Mrs>. <laughs> Mark, do you know what would happen if everyone had sandwiches? No, Mrs. Thomas. I'll tell you the last bit. So kill a line. Don't fuck that. <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> Come on, it's your big moment. Okay, I can hear that. I've got the tray. You've not got oh. the tray. <laughs> do you know what would happen? No. I wouldn't have a job, Mark. My son Richard wouldn't have any food for Christmas. Oh. Brilliant. Now, I didn't give a shit about Richard. At all. I knew him, I didn't like him. Right? That's not true, he's lovely. But I really cared about Mrs. Thomas because she was the only nice dinner lady of the four. And it was one of those moments that I just thought, with power comes responsibility, with disruption comes an action. There was no kindness in what I was doing. I felt it was the right thing to do because I, I wanted to change things and I wanted to have monster lunch for my dinner. <laughs> Didn't have pickled onion then, it was only beef. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I, I, and Mrs. Thomas, you were right. Four years later, there were no dinner ladies at that school. We just had lunchtime supervisors. And what I started lost people their jobs. So, so be careful what you wish for and be careful what you do. So that was... That was my first experience of maybe a lack of kindness from me, or a lack of thought from me. But I can't hang myself over it, obviously. After that, we've had that, haven't we? After that, um, six four, happy hour. Cash Martin, you all know this song, don't you? Utter genius. I was in a heavy metal a cappella band <laughs> called Purple Wife Fronts. And this was the this was the kind of mid. 80s, 85 to 87, and kindness was in really short supply. The words we used to describe each other, you'd call them banter now, which is just bullying with words, right? I, I wasn't nice. None of us were. We were all the same. It was just dreadful. And one of my best friends was gay, but we didn't know he was gay, and he dared not tell anyone he was gay. He was absolutely mercilessly ripped. And there was like the leader, that wasn't me, there was the leader, and he was just nasty. And it took two years before anyone, me in this case, stood up to him. Because there was just this culture of, of, of unpleasantness and you only ever seemed to be growing if you were nastier than, than the others. And it was really horrible. And at this time football violence was massive as well. 
you didn't you couldn't go to a match without it, the threat of something kicking off. When there was a game in Leicester, you had all of the away fans were the the, 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 the club in Leicester at the time, the, the ground in Leicester was on Filbert Street, quite a long walk from the train station, and everyone was accompanied by the big boxes. It was just this this simmering kind of aggression. And I always remember just being physically scared for, for my life, being in the wrong place at, at the wrong time. But it was about to change. It was about to change really, really positively. And it was about to change because drugs. The late 80s, don't laugh. You were there. The late 80s were incredible. So I went to university in the late 80s, as I said, and suddenly, this thing called MDMA ecstasy emerged. I've never had MDMA. I'll make that really clear. I'm way more into LSD. Okay? <laughs> but everything changed. Football violence stopped. Nearly, unless you're at Millwall. <laughs> because you don't want to fight when you're loved up. You go out drinking at night, you take a tablet, a disco biscuit, you stop drinking. The violence goes because the alcohol goes. No one wants to fight you. And you end up drinking Lucasade all night, which is something you only ever drank when you were really ill. <laughs> you knew that if you were in hospital and someone gave you a bottle of Lucasade, you had days. <laughs> and there's a really interesting story here. So Lucasade became a massive clubbing drink. Glass bottle is fucking dangerous. So they shifted to plastic. More plastic later. And, um, and you could dance with it. Well, it was more like that at the time, I don't remember, to be fair. Um, but Smith Klein Beecham got wind that Lucasaid was like the drink of choice for druggies. And it nearly pulled it from the clubs. And then Adamski, British DJ, released an album called NRG. And on the front of it, he put a bottle of Lucasaid with the letters NRG on it. And Smith Klein Beecham nearly took him to court and said, That's our copyright. Yes, it was, a <laughs> it was just a ripoff. And somebody smart. So let's just, give it, let's just give it the kindness of some thought. What if we pull it? This is the way the world is. We, we don't necessarily control it. But what if, if we pull it, we look ridiculous? Other option, let's use it. Our next advert will be a bottle of Lucasaid with the letters NRG on it. We'll take Adamski's album and we'll feed it back to him. And they did. Somebody in Smith Klein Beecham was really smart. And suddenly, Lucasaid became something. It shifted their entire culture. It became something that you drank, not when you were dying, but it's something you drank to become a better you. Whether that was more dancier, whether that was LucasAid sport and therefore enhanced your performance that way, whether it was LucasAid and the hydration stuff, it changed their corporate culture through one decision. Someone just saying, let's not take the negative approach to this. Let's be a little bit more, more positive. So, um, where was I? I can't remember where I was. 19, oh yeah, um, <coughs> the back one. So this was really interesting because I was working at um, Tesco's in my holidays to pay off my, how I got an overdraft, I don't know, but to pay off my overdraft. And um, this was a really interesting period. So you've got Acid House, I was DJ, and you've got Chicago House, which I'll play you in a minute, and, um, and, you ha and I had an overdraft because I was buying records. And, uh, records were expensive. And I went to work in Tesco's, and I was also uh, an active member of the Leicestershire anti-apartheid chapter. It was quite a small chapter. And, um, <laughs> And I was boycotting South African fruit. And I don't know whether this was a really good thing or I don't know whether it did more harm than good. I don't know those things at all. But I, I boycotted it because that's what the anti-apartheid movement said we should do. So I'm, I'm not eating the apples. And suddenly, someone at Tesco's is asking me to move the apples. There's a massive box. It's got Cape, Republic of, um, Produce of South Africa. And I'm looking at the apples and I'm thinking, oh, I don't eat them. Why, why should I move them? <laughs> and um, the supervisor saw me dithering. And he said, they've been all right. And I said, uh, not really. There's this thing called apartheid, and if you say it out loud, you'll feel sick. And I uh, don't eat the apples. I don't think I should move them. And he said, um, are you on strike? I thought, fuck, why has this happened? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, um, yeah, yeah, I am. Because <laughs> if you stand for nothing, you fall for anything, right? And I just thought, I'm not doing it. And 30 people behind me, all the other temps, went, yeah, we're not moving the apples either. <laughs> and they, I'll be honest, they were a fuck of a long way behind me. They weren't like, right, it wasn't I am Spartacus, it's like we might know Spartacus. Because of next Spartacus once. 
And I'm stood there thinking, fuck, I'm, there's only one person in the glass radius here, it's me. I'm going to lose my job, they give me overdraft. And um, he said, okay, then we get it. I'll find someone with no morals to move the apples. <laughs> fuck, ones to choose from. Um, <laughs> he was great, actually. Tesco's were great. I can't criticise him at all. And, um, and he said, uh, don't worry about it. You lot, you're on cereals. Mark, you're in the freezer for three days. True story. He gave me, like, protective wear. And, <laughs> and, um, and all, all three days I'm thinking I did the right thing, because if you stand for nothing, you, f you fall for anything. And within a year, apartheid was dead. Long may it continue to be dead. And in reality, it still exists. And the way we treat people. We've only got to walk through certain American cities just to see those that have the least. It's much more likely that someone that doesn't look like me will get shot than someone that does look like me. And that's a form of apartheid. It's horrific, and we've got to deal with it. It's just it's crazy. Diversity really matters. The most successful businesses on the planet are the most diverse. Proven. T time and time again. And it's not just diversity of the way we look, it's diversity of our gender, our sexuality, it's diversity of the way we think. You shouldn't be working with people that look like you, he said to a room full of white people that look like you. <laughs> <laughs> nearly, nearly all white people. This is called one, I know. I get it. But it's got to change. It has to change. Um, what it has it at um, Chicago House sound like? I think it's on this next one. Now I'm not gay. <laughs> okay, after that I went to work at Business Link um, in Bradford and uh, Business Link sounded like this. <laughs> Just that indie jangle. <laughs> and I loved working at Business Link. I was in the economic development unit but I was doing sustainability. I was like the kind bit of that. If they ever had any nutters that came in, in their minds, people who had got, got a stupid idea about solar panels everywhere, why about, what's that from there? <laughs> Have you touched my laptop? No, I'm joking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I made you feel really, really guilty then, didn't I? Let me put that back on and let me just do that a little bit more. Uh, and that should be it. And I was like the kind bit of the economic development unit, because all the others were about inward investment. Inward investment is just outward investment in a few years' time. They were all about driving quarterly growth. That was all about reducing resource use. I, I did sustainability from 1994 with a job. It was a long time ago. I'm good at it. I know what I'm talking about. And we live in a really interesting time where sustainability is big again. <coughs> Sometimes the science is forgotten. I'm going to come on to that later. But it's really important. I'll take people being interested, but not totally accurate, over not being interested. We can, we can correct the rest. So I really enjoyed that, and actually I had a really great boss who was super kind. Best boss I ever had, a chap called Dai Lana. I worked in an amazing team. <coughs> we trusted each other. Um, <coughs> that, that was pre-business link. I was, I was in the economic development unit. When I crossed through the doors when this thing called business link came out, I had a boss who was really nice, but a team that was really bullying. And the contract manager bullied me. I'm a big guy and I can normally look after myself. And over two years, he reduced me into just in tears. I, I had two weeks in bed, I resigned. I had two weeks in bed, I couldn't cross the road on my own, I couldn't go to the shops on my own. I used to leave little recorded notes for the kids because I thought I'd got CJD, tell them how much I loved them and then hide the cassettes around the house. I was properly fucking broken. And I was broken just because I was bullied. And, and, and there's a thing, around how you respond, and I maybe didn't respond the right way, and I may, maybe there's some of it's my fault, maybe, but I've seen bullying in the workplace so many times, and I've never seen it be to the fault of the victim, ever. It's always about the bully. And we've just got to cut it out. I was not protected. At school, I played rugby. I played rugby for Tigers youth team. I was really good, I played fly half. I had two flankers, that's the people on the edge of the scrum, their job was to protect me and the scrum half. That was their job. Great job, actually. I should have played that position. Working in a business, I had no flankers. I had none. Completely exposed. And because I'm really open and quite vulnerable, people see that as a weakness. It's a strength. It doesn't feel like it sometimes. It took me two years to recover from that. Utterly dreadful experience. 
What I thought I'd do after that dreadful experience is join ASDA. <laughs> and at this time, gorillas were huge. I'm looking at my new Damon Albarn back in the Blur days, so I enjoyed it. And at ASDA, I was um, nearly sacked six times in a year. That's pretty good, right? <laughs> this was 99, 2000. Sacked for, nearly sacked first for putting solar panels on new stores. What are you trying to do? Save some energy. Sacked second time for putting local traders in store. Actually, putting them in store. Profit on green goods in, in, in supermarkets about 6%. We were going to charge them 10% of turnover. So we make more profit. They get greater footfall. We can grow brilliant community ventures in store. Not in car parks. In store. Bigger through throughput. What are you trying to do? Kill us? Save you. It's nearly sacked third time. Sustainable urban drainages. Drainages? Drainage. Our car parks just took water and pushed it to places where it shouldn't be. You make the car parks bleed, it goes through, it goes back into the groundwater, you solve problems. Nearly sacked for that. Fourth time, nearly sacked, um, uh, fair trade. What are you trying to do? I'm not even going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you think trade shouldn't be fair, then you can't. And they, and they were. Um, fifth time, organic food. We need organic food in store. Why? It's a big market. I had to and learn in the end how to speak their, their language. So, so I, I got I got that one through. Fifth time, sixth time, nearly sacked. Giving company bikes to every single colleague so they could cycle to work. We just did them at cost, thirty pounds instead of a hundred pound. Idiot. Oh no, it was the seventh time. Uh, delivery on uh, of um, of dry goods by canal boat. Oh, there was an eighth time. Um, <laughs> packaging reduction, making it thinner, lighter, better, and and that just saved money. So in the end, I learned. Put it into payback terms, and you learn. Um, and I was massively bullied by my boss, to the point where it, she was just horrific. So I came from one situation into another. So what, who am I beginning to, bl to blame here? Me. It's my fault. I'm the victim. And you end up putting that victim t-shirt on, and actually, it's not yours to wear. It didn't serve you, and you're not that person. So that was a really tough time. And then I was like, my own business. And I loved it. And I ran it for 10 years. And about halfway through that, I realised that we've got a really toxic male culture in the business. There were nine of us. Eight of us were men. <coughs> and it had become horrible. I'd sat over, if not created, a culture that I wasn't proud of. So just stopped. Everyone went. But I found another job, so I didn't just sack up. Fucking <laughs> um, and, and I rebuilt myself. And I realised that actually you can be successful and nice. And I, and I wasn't horrible, but I just let horribleness creep in. We'd made a few really bad hires. The culture had shifted towards a kind of loaded FHM culture. And that's not right. So we stopped. Stopped in our tracks. I'm not saying the Arctic Monkeys are FHM, by the way. They're just sewn off. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to um, be really good friends with a guy called Andy Middleton, who some of you will know through B Corp. And Andy Middleton introduced me to Dave Hyatt and Claire Hyatt, who created Do Lectures in Cardigan. And, um, and they're geniuses, and they do a really great job. And then there were, there were three people, me, Andy, a guy called Carlo, who put a, bit of, put a bit of money in. I was the last of those to join. Put a bit of money in and support the Do Lectures. And the Do is all about spreading great ideas. It's an encouragement network, and, and I love it. It's the, best, it's the best event that I'm involved with as an organiser. It's, it's brilliant. I heartily recommend it. Um, and it's just great to see that it's spawned other events. Because not, not everyone can go there. And it's crazy expensive. But that's scarcity. That's 100 places. Of course it's going to be. So it's fabulous that I'm here doing this with you. And I wrote a book called Do Disrupt. And this was at a time when disruption was very rarely used. Now it's become like a trinket in the jewellery box of business bollocks. And, and everyone uses it and hardly anybody does it. And it irritates the shit out of me. Trust me, mint dog food is not disruptive. <laughs> Probably is, actually. <laughs> Another flavour of ice cream is not disruptive. Ambient ice cream. Ice cream that you can deliver at room temperature, not to the house, that'd be dreadful, but to the store, because it's got no dairy in it. Well, that's interesting. That becomes really disruptive. That, that reduces energy in the supply chain massively. 
and obviously dairy free is where we're all headed, post cow is where we're all headed. Um, so I, I really enjoyed writing Do Disrupt and it's a bit embarrassing now because the word's embarrassing but um, it's a good book, love it. And now I run an agency called Ape where I help big companies think small and small companies think big and, uh, and I did, I had that apothecal moment in, um, in Margate in a camper van where I realised I had no money. I burnt all my money in a, in a partnership with a branding agency and I needed to do something. And so I had to embrace the dark side again. I had to go back to the Asda side, but I could turn a big super tank around. And I've done it in a really nice way. I only work with nice people when they're big businesses. There are great people in big businesses. Don't, don't write them off. There's some amazing, kind, hearted people who want to change the world in there. And I, and, I, and I work with them on projects that are incredible. So I'm helping those big businesses not kill people with sugar not kill people with, with, where their supply chains are really disastrous. And it's really hard, but we're winning. 10 years ago, we weren't listened to internally, so I find the pirates, and you know, they find me, and we do great stuff, absolutely love it. And all of that's fascinating, but my favorite thing is my hot sauce brand called Hot Smoky Bastard. <laughs> dot com. What I love, I, I never make any, I've really got to sort myself out. Um, I really like making it, and it just takes up so, I make it in the kitchen, it takes up so much time. And the reason this is on there is I had the idea to make some hot sauce on a Saturday morning, glancing at a post from a friend of mine. I have to use my thumb when I look down at the other hand there. That's ridiculous. I, 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 I can't stop. <laughs> Put it in pocket, Shayla. And um, I was looking at a post from a friend of mine in Australia who was smoking chilies, and I said, Rohan, what are you doing? Smoking chilies, why? I said, I'm making smoked chili sauce. I thought, I've got loads of chilies, got to smoke. I can't keep my hands still. I'm going to push it proper down. Um, I'm going to smoke some chilies and make some chili sauce. Here it comes. So I made some chili sauce in a big vat, and I thought, this is, this is tasty, but I've made way too much chili sauce. I've made like 20 litres of it. So I went on, on Amazon, I know, and I bought some bottles, and they were delivered the next day. And I sat and thought about a brand, and I thought, yeah, I'll call it Hot Smoky Bastard, strap line, straight from the devil's arse. <laughs> and, so, and the bottles arrived on the Sunday, and I filled them up, and I went into the studio on the Monday, and I employed some designers, and I said, hey, guys, can you come up with a brand, in, brand for me, really nice, simple brand, Hot Smoky Bastard? And they did that classic thing of going hot with flames and smoke with smoke, and I went, no. I want the ugliest typeface. I want the R to be so ugly you can barely look at it. So I did it myself. Um, and, um, and by Monday, I'm online selling it. Three days. So if you're doing the wrong job, if you've not got what you want in front of you, work-wise, just do something for you. And you've all got a side hustle, yeah? Everyone's got a side hustle. If you haven't, have, please have a side hustle. You, I learned so much doing this. Firstly, about acidity. <laughs> if you get your acidity wrong, you end up shipping quite explosive bottles of really hot sauce. <laughs> Luckily, the first one arrived with a good friend of mine, Tom Herbert, who's a telly baker, and um, he took the lid off it and it hit the ceiling. <laughs> Not joking. So I had to, I've learned loads, got all legal and stuff. Um, so that's my kind of career highlights. Let's go see what the next slide is. And why is there another one of those on? There shouldn't be. Oh, yeah, you don't need to hear any more music. Is <laughs> right, back a bit. We don't want to lose that. Um, so right now, I work with big companies trying to help them do good. And what I see, particularly in the American ones, and maybe it's a reaction to Trump, is I see a desire to treat people better. I see a desire to increase diversity and to be nice to people. And I don't mean be soft, like it's different, okay? It's different. When I was at Asda, I asked, there was a bank of car parking spaces that were labeled mums on the schoolroom. And I didn't see my children awake during the week for 15 months. Just think about that. They were asleep every time I saw them, Monday to Friday, for 15 months, apart from holidays. So I said to my boss, can I come in late on a Wednesday and <coughs> you've got the mums on the schoolroom spaces open till 9.30. They'll be in by 9.15. Then I can take Daisy and Max to uni. To, to uni? To school. <laughs> oh, God, there they are now. And, um, and she said, no, you can't. That's sexism. Because if I was a woman, she wouldn't have stopped me. And I said, OK, why? She says, what do you think this business would look like if everybody came in late one day a week? I said, probably a lot happier than it was. <laughs> <laughs> we hated each other. <laughs> and... Um, 
And where I see it now is I see every single business understanding that Gen Z and the end millennials, they're different. They care. They're not lazy. They're not any of those things that people say they are. They care. They're different from us. But we're the same as them. They're our children. We behave like them. We pick it up from them. They're teaching me more than I ever thought I'd teach them. And so every single business is saying to me, how do we be nicer? How do we change our culture? And that's what I'm, what I'm working on with them. And you know, when you see this on the Brit Awards, and good is the new cool. It really is. I don't know anyone in business at the moment that, that would deny this. I don't know anyone in business at the moment that isn't working on this. Whether it be their supply chains or their packaging, whether it be the way they do business, their business models, whether it be engaging smaller um, suppliers, whether it be working with people that can't afford their products, they're do everyone's doing it. No one's talking about it. You, you all look at it and think it's probably nothing's changed. It's all changed. They're waiting for the first one to fill up with the water. At the moment, like a swan. Just still, no one's no changed above the water, under the water, pedaling like fuck. And they're all realigning because the consumer base has changed massively. So good is the new call, and kindness is a competitive advantage. The stats are out there that the companies that look after their employees the most are the companies that keep their employees for longer. How we, how we treat our customers really matters as to whether they, they come back to us. And there's loads of stuff in Harvard Business Review about this that's really worth, really worth looking at. And there's an Adam Grant wrote a really nice book called Give and Take, which looks at the most successful people within the corporate world, and it splits into four. <coughs> Those people who've got the biggest um, achievements, they're givers. Those people that have got the second level, they're normally matchers, but sometimes they're takers, third takers. The least successful people, they're givers again. The difference is, these givers protect themselves from these takers, and these givers haven't identified how to do that yet. You are more successful if you're a giver than a taker. There you go. Um, no one likes a Mr. Nasty Pants or a Mrs. Nasty Pants. No one does. No one does. And it used to be something you were proud of that you could work. Being the bastard. I, I can name three bastards I work with that were really good. They would have had it as a middle name. <laughs> Steve Bastard Rack. You'd have had it as a middle name. <laughs> I'm not even going to bother about redacting that. <laughs> um, no, even if they're rainbow, no one, no one likes that. But kindness is bigger than people. Being kind to the people we work with is one thing. But it's way bigger than that. Sustainability is a horrible word. I've been working in it for a long, long time. And I prefer to use the word eco. eco. And I didn't for ages, but eco is a really beautiful word. It comes from the Greek oikos, which means home. And it's shared with ecology and economy. And all eco means keeping your house in order. That's all it means. And one way is the way you measure it, and another, and another way is the way you measure it. It's the same, it's the same, they're the same thing. And when you look at Karl Marx <coughs> and his equation of production, raw materials plus labour equals product plus profit plus waste. For years, this was built on unkindness. These were free or paid poorly for. In the UK, we stole them from the North and the Southwest and from Wales. Then we stole them from our countries that we owned, right? But utterly dreadful. So these were free. This was cheap. When it became more expensive and protected, we moved it elsewhere, so it was cheap. And then it became more expensive and protected, so we moved it elsewhere, and it was cheap. And you look at China's investment in Africa, it's not just about raw materials, it's about cheap labour. And product, we sell that, that's fine, does a good job, but not so good that it lasts forever. It collapses too young, it, it's got planned obsolescence built in, there's an unkindness built into the product. And then we had profit, and we maximise that, because that's the only way, 120 years ago, when we wrote the laws, the corporate legal responsibilities, the only way you could measure good was in money. And we still do it now. We don't have to. We can measure good in so many other ways. There's a revolution coming here yet, and we need the accountants to do it. I never thought I'd say that. <laughs>
The waste was free. Just throw away. Where is away? Where is away? Away has gone away. We need to be super careful about this. So this has become more expensive. And consequently, this whole equation has changed. And I've got a few examples over time of where kindness and business have completely separated. And the first is from Ford, 1973. The Ford Pinto. You know this car, yeah? So the Ford Pinto was released with a, um, a petrol tank at the back, underneath the back bumper. And the Ford Pinto resulted in 180 deaths from rear collisions. As people hit it, it would ignite. It was really badly designed. And Ford did this. It was the first, it was the first calculation of whether it was worth replacing something around the, about the price of a life. They worked out that the price of a life in America at that time was about $100,000. And they said, we're likely to have this many deaths. I'd say that's two million. Um, we're likely to spend three million fixing it. This is the first cost benefit analysis. And they said, yeah, that, that figure's bigger than that figure, so we won't bother fixing it, we'll just enter the deaths. <coughs> just think about that. And they lost so much brand love, obviously. They pulled the car in the end. And, and it's one of those moments where uh, the unkindness became clear. But it, it wasn't, it wasn't yeah, the last one. Yeah. You know, in this case, you. I've got to stop, that's too noisy, but I do love it. Nils, Nils works with Volvo, which is the opposite. 1959, he invented the three-point seatbelt. Until then, it was just a lap belt. The lap belt was in the middle of cars until 15 years ago. The lap belt's really dangerous, breaks your internal organs, breaks your hips, breaks your back. It's better than not having a belt, because otherwise you break your face, but, but it's, not, it's not nice. He invented the three-point seatbelt for Volvo, and they had two choices. They could license it and make a fuckload of money, or they could give it away. What did they do? Gave it away, because they wanted to be known as the, car, the world's most safest brand for cars, and they are known as that. And their new, their new mission, no one will ever die in a Volvo by 2020. Isn't that amazing? How they do that, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Utterly love it. You know what you make of? Bhopal. This was a massive gas leak. This killed 4,000 people. And it was due to skimping on maintenance. This is corporate, so corporate murder. Exxon Valdez, 1989. What a tune. I'm struggling not to dance and never do nastiness on screen. And this was down to the crew not being looked after properly. The third mate be, being asked to manoeuvre the vessel and massively overworked so no one else could do it. This was a lack of kindness and care. That song is beautiful. And this, this is just lies. I'll never buy a VW again. Ever. And I've got a camper van along. That's going. Respray, maximise its value, flip it, it's going. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do this anymore, and BMW did not lie. But, but, but VW did. There's no kindness in this. And, and yet, and yet, it still goes on. So why does this matter? What, what is this all about, really? Why is the hippie with the word love on his t-shirt and some flowery trousers telling me all about why I should be kinder? Because we face like, loads and loads of challenges. Like, this is the most amazing time to be alive. I mean that. This is the most challenging time to be alive. The power of creativity in our black mirrors. Opportunity that we've never had. And it's just brilliant. Power's moving east. Power's moving towards women. Power's moving from old to young. This is an amazingly positive time. But we've got some seriously big things to deal with. How do we attract and retain the best talent? How do we do that in a world that is Easterifying and becoming more and more competitive? 
when people are one to up themselves, not for big businesses. Well, we've got to create incredible cultures. You've got to create a culture where people go, I really want to work for you. No one's going to want to work for a nasty company. Just not. I lecture at universities and I see this firsthand. They want to do good. There's a couple that want to go and work for companies that aren't so great. But you know what? Those companies that traditionally weren't so great, they're changing so fast, it's untrue. Whether, I, I'm not even going to name them, but my biggest clients, the FMCGs, they, they're, they're changing, they're peddling so fast, but it's going to take a little while for them to get there. How do you grow customers that absolutely love you and become your evangelist? Be kind. 60% of our marketing, 60% of our marketing, according to Mark Schaefer, Peter Schaefer, Peter Schaefer, Mark Schaefer, that's nearly me, um, <laughs> is done by other people. It's word of mouth. It's not you, you can't, control, you can't control your content anymore. Somebody else is in control of your content. So you can only be brilliant, and you can only be brilliant. Jerry Garcia once said, it's not good enough to be the best of the best. You've got to be the only people that do what you do. And I mean that. I really mean that. There's a massive problem with recruiting great talent at the moment. There's a massive problem with um, wanting to align to brands that you believe in. And you can only do it by being honest, being open. And when you fuck up, be honest. No one, everyone gets it, don't they? Fucked up. We're really sorry. This is how we fucked up. This is why we fucked up. <coughs> We're going to change it. <coughs> I've said that already. And how do you make the same money from selling less stuff? Because raw materials are in decline. China own access to between 70 and 94% of all the world's rare earths. Their investment in, that, in Africa is about raw materials, it's about cheap labour. If you want to make things, you've got to have stuff to make them from. You have to be kind to resources. And for years, we've chased the recycling of weight. So we recycle all of our gadgety phones. Because, do you know what? There's a target on this, and it's about 60% by weight. By weight. The heavy stuff isn't the valuable stuff. The valuable stuff is all raw materials, rare earths. It's the tantalum in the capacitors. And let me tell you now, the tantalum in this phone, no matter what Apple tell you or Samsung tell you, 65% of it comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Officially, it's only 15%. It leaks out into Rwanda, into Tanzania, into Kenya, who don't even have any tantalum, and it gets sold. It's, it's, it's obscure. And if you have to add the words Democratic and Republic to the name of your country, you can be assured it's neither of those things. A little bit like United Kingdom. <laughs> In Great Britain. The United States. Right? So how do we make more money from selling less stuff? I'm, I'm lucky. Right? I'm middle class. I'm 50. I'm white. I'm vegan. I take photos on film. I ride my bike on a Saturday and I make sourdough bread on a Sunday. Right? That's my life. I can afford a pair of 170 pound jeans. I can afford those. They're repaired free for life in Wales. Love them. If I've got no money, I can't afford them. It's all right for me. They're the cheapest jeans I'll ever own, by the way. They're, they'll last me longer than any other, and they'll cost me nothing to repair. What if I've, got not, if I've not got 170 pounds? What do I do? Well, I can go online and I can buy a pair of 501s for 35 pounds. They're great jeans, lovely fit, nice high rise. Gorgeous taper, they're a brilliant jeans. I like jeans. They're 50 quid online ish. Sometimes a little bit later. If I've not got 50 quid, I can't buy them. So where do I go next? I go to something my nan would have called a club book, Grattan. And if it's an IT thing, if it's a TV thing, I go to something called Bright House. Now here's the thing. If I go to Bright House for a 600 pound Samsung TV, guess how much it costs at Bright House? 1,200 pounds. 1,000 pounds. 400 pounds more just to buy it. I'm not talking finance, I'm talking just to buy it. If I want to buy a pair of 501s in Grattan, what am I paying? 95 pounds. I can buy them on the internet for under 50. Poor pay more always. And then because I haven't got 50, I haven't got 95 pounds or I haven't got 1,000 pounds, I tick the box that says pay weekly. You can pop an A in that weekly if you want. Pay weekly. 
Guess what the interest rate of Grafton's is? And I'm not knocking them, this is what they all do. Have a guess what the interest rate is. 25. Higher. <laughs> Between 29 and 39, depends on, on who you're buying through. It's high, right? What's base rate? One and a half, something like that. Mm -hmm. 29%. Here's the thing, over four years, a pair of cheap jeans from Grattan's cost me more than my handmade jeans from Wales, which are repaired for life. It's not that the poor can't afford or don't deserve what I have, it's the fact that the business model works against them. If we want to consume less, we have to make better, more affordable. The revolution we need is in business models. The revolution we need is not in new products. And how do we make products and services that do less harm? Because we all care about plastic. Plastic Geddon is massive. And I get it. I get it completely. And single-use plastics are dreadful and there is no place for them in the ocean. None. What are the three biggest risks to the ocean? Number one, what's the biggest risk to the ocean? Acidification. Acidification due to climate change. Temperature rise. What's the second biggest risk to the ocean? Thank you, overfishing. And the third is ocean debris. And on my Dollar Thorpe Goes Plastic Free local Facebook group, the question that, as they know what I do, it's fucking irritating now. Um, the question that infuriates me the most was, has anyone noticed where you can get plastic free wrapped fish? <laughs> How much do you at leave, honestly? Why would you want plastic free wrapped fish? Well, we don't want plastic because it destroys the oceans and the fish. <laughs> the thing is, if you really give a shit about the fish, don't eat them. Like, fundamentally, like, the plastic matters. It really matters. Don't eat them. What I'm trying to say here, it's really hard to know what is good and what is bad. Really hard. For example, I've been, I use this brand, right? This toilet roll brand. I use them. I like them. The, the toilet roll's great. It's hefty. We never run out. And I'm a big user, right? I'm four a day, <laughs> three before breakfast. We've had a bit of work from down there, right? So... So I, I, I love it. But I had a sneaking suspicion the stuff wasn't right. Because I'm an environmental consultant, I measure everything in carbon. And therein lies one of the problems. So I thought, I'm going to have a quick look at which is the greenest packaging. Forget the toilet rolls. Don't forget the toilet rolls. Each sheet here is 10 centimetres long. Each sheet of the normal standard toilet roll is 12 and a half centimetres long. I average three sheets per wipe. <laughs> you may be more. Quite three sheets per wipe, but you don't want to pop through, do you? No one wants to let you buy. No one wants to. But, but you might be less, right? When I'm using who gives a crap, I'm at least four sheets a wipe. There's a little bit of plyness in, right? But, that, but there's a nice sort of attrition that there's a good strength, yeah? <laughs> so I began to look at this and I went into some significant detail. Who gives a crap? Packaging alone, I reckon it's 0 0.067 grams of carbon per wipe. <coughs> per wipe. Because it's shipped from China, by the way, it adds a tiny little bit. The shipping is, is minimal. Minimal. When you look at the Tesco recycled one, it's made in Portugal, so it makes no difference at all in terms of shipping. That's 0 0.03 grams per wipe, and that's wrapped in plastic. So here's our dilemma. Like, we don't want plastic, and we definitely don't want it in the fucking ocean. 80% of ocean plastic comes from 10 rivers. 10 rivers. But we ship overseas. The system is our fault. I'm not blaming people in Africa and India. It's our fault. What do you do for the best? Where do you go? Each wipe is costing me twice as much carbon if I do the right thing than if I do the wrong thing. What we failed to do, this is a plea to explain the complexity of sustainability in, in greater clarity. Because when my friends who run a vegan ready, 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 ready meal company put stuff online, the only question they get is, how can you get rid of all the plastic? Well, actually, it's all bioplastic, which is a shit solution, by the way. We'll come to that maybe later. I will be here. Um, or see you. So um, how do we make better decisions? How do we do that? How do we be kind? We just... We just need to be a little bit more cognizant. Now, back to the sustainability stuff. I'll take the passion. I'll take the Facebook comments. I'll take the... I know that if you drive to Doncaster, you can get an aluminium dustpan and brush. 
instead of plastic. Yeah, but you've just driven to Doncaster to get it. I'll take that. Because what I've got is I've got an engaged population, and for two, two generations I didn't have one. So I'll take it. It's a good thing. And trust me, plastic has no place in the ocean. None. We've got to solve it. We've got to solve single use. It's a real problem. So I said this a few years ago. It's not sufficient to, be, to do things better. We need to do better things. And I genuinely, genuinely mean it. And so do consumers. If you look at what Edelman are doing, their, their, their research over the last 10 years, looking at pur purpose-driven buyers, belief-driven buyers, is shifting the way that we understand consumption. I'm not saying consumption shifting, I'm not saying that yet. But this is beginning to happen. And there's, the Edelman's a really, it's American, but it's a really good report, written every 12 months. <coughs> I heartily recommend you read last year's. And whether you think you can change as a business, or whether you think you can't, you're right. Because we all carry constraining beliefs. I'm going to do this really fast because I've taken up way too much time. How many of you have seen a film called The Pike Syndrome? That sounds like a horror film, it isn't. <laughs> so The Pike Syndrome is based on an experiment that Malthus did, that Mobius did, in 1846. And what Mobius did was he put a pike in a tank and he put lots of fish in the tank. And the pike ate the little fish. It's carnivorous, it's got a mild underbite, it does, that's what it does, right? He then put a glass bell jar in the tank and he filled the tank with little fish and the pike was on the outside of the tank and the little fish were on the inside of the tank. It had water in it, they weren't just blocking it back. And the pike can see the little fish but he can't see the bell jar. So it tries to eat the little fish and it swims into the side of the bell jar. It bruises its nose, it gets proper fucked off and it just goes down. Like this, like a ski jumper. <laughs> just sat there. And after three or four hours they take the bell jar out of the tank and the little fish go... And they swim across the front of the pike and down the side of the pike and over its back. And guess what the pike does? Nothing. Constraining believers, it can't eat the fish. And if you leave, what, what, what Mobius did is he left the pike in there. And the pike died. The pike starved to death, surrounded by food. We go out of business, surrounded by opportunity. We go out of business, surrounded by the best talent that we've just not invited into to our business. That's a constraining belief, and we've all got them. And here's the interesting thing. When you train fleas, how many of you have trained fleas here? <laughs> no? When you train fleas, it's quite a beautiful picture of an ugly thing. And what is this? You can probably tell. What is this patch there? It's like a splash of feathers. <laughs> and when you train fleas, you put them in a jar. Fleas will jump two meters. You want them to jump 30 centimeters or whatever. You put them in a jar of 30 centimeters, and they jump 30 centimeters. And after a day, you take the lid off and the fleas won't jump out of the jar. And you turn the jar over and they're now free. They're free fleas. And they only jump 30 centimetres. That's fascinating. That's the same as a pike. Here's the really interesting thing. When they, ha when they lay eggs and have offspring, their offspring only jump 30 centimetres. So we pass our constraining beliefs on, whether we do it to our children, our nieces, our nephews, our friends, our employees, we do it. Your business doesn't need to be what it is now. It can be kinder. You don't have to have you drop your morals at the door when you work here. You can be kinder. You're the catalyst. You're the person that changes this sort of stuff. It really matters. I was going to show you an example of Nike here, um, but I'm running out of time, so I'm probably going to zing through it. Um, I'll just leave that on the slide just for a second because it's almost impossible to think that that was not, that, that, that they're not my words, that they're Nike words. That's our stories. Put it in the chamber. And the whole point of this story is all of these three people, great golfer, not such a nice man. Great sprinter, not such a nice man. Not such a nice man. This is my body. Lance Armstrong. And I can do whatever I want to it. And Nike knew that. They, they, they know these people. I know people at the top of sports, but top cycling teams, they all knew what Lance Armstrong was doing. They ignored the fact that they weren't kind people. They aligned themselves with, with sporting excellence, and they said that they were about extraordinary people doing ordinary things. What Nike are really about is ordinary people doing extraordinary things. They're about moving more, that's, what, that's all they're about. And it took them a long time to realize that. I've been working with them um, over, the, over the years, and, and they're back, and they do amazing stuff now. They just stand for something, I said it earlier. Stand for, stand for living your fault or anything. And they got a lot of shit over this. People were burning their Nikes. What did Nike do? 
Limited edition pre burnt <laughs> shoes. <laughs> Genius. What did Nike do? If you're going to burn your shoes, this is how you do it safely. This is genius. But if you're going to take this approach to being nicer, to being kinder, to valuing, to respecting, this isn't about being soft, this is about respect. Don't say it and not do it. I see this all the time. Teams win and then treat the team like shit. Be kind and then be nasty. I see it all the time. You can't believe your own press. We can see everything now. Black Mirror has given us 360 degree visibility. We can see inside all businesses. Stuff comes out. So as we kind to yourself, Matt, and it starts here. It starts here. If you're not kind to you, you won't be kind to anybody else. If you don't value who you are, you won't value who anybody else is. If you don't love you, how's anyone else going to love you? So it starts with really sort of hippie, shitty, Buddhist shit. <laughs> Fucking loving it, I'm all over that. Um, this stuff really matters. And in my 50s, I'm not going to read them out because I've, there's too many. Of, I, I might do, actually. Fuck it, it's only my turn list. Um, in, <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> in, in my 50 years, this is what I've learned. The world's got other bastards in them. They don't need any more. Just be kind. You're good enough. You're not too fat, too bold, too whatever. You, you're good enough. Whatever you are, you're good enough. When you change, some people won't like it. Some of your friends won't be your friends anymore. That's okay. They're, they're not for you. You can't be for everybody. Just the sexy people. <laughs> and when you resonate at a slightly higher frequency, they'll drop off, and this is about their fears, not, not about you. And that's okay. It took me a long time to get my head around that. You look amazing when you feel confident. Confidence is so beautiful. Being still is as important as moving. Listening is as important as talking. Don't just talk about it, do it. Don't believe your own press. Be humble. Jump in cold water more often. Get sweaty more often. Be aware that every single person has imposter syndrome. And if they're not, if they say they haven't, they're an imposter. <laughs> um, love with all your heart. Don't hold back on love. <laughs> Money matters. As having too little gets in the way, but having too much gets in the way too. If you make a deal with someone, stick to it, otherwise I'm never going to make a deal with you again. Fuck, this is important. Sleep well. Eat less harm. I'm not saying everyone should stop eating animals. I'm saying you should eat fewer. Right? And don't eat fucking fish if you really believe in the oceans. Or be careful which ones you do eat. Right? I, I, I could, this is a whole lecture. Yoga is magic. Right? Embrace it. If you think you're too big... You don't, you, I'm a big unit and I don't find it very neat, is my general response <laughs> to anyone that said, would you like to do yoga? And I went to California and I came back all fucking namaste. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and my wife, who was trying to persuade me to do yoga, said, what happened? And I said, oh, I just really got it. And she went, yeah, I saw the photographs of the yoga teacher. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got it. Kerry Kelly, she's lovely, but I don't fancy her. I make it very clear. Um, love is your friend, but if you chase it, it will become as elusive as a rainbow's end. It will find you. It, it will find you, but you've got to be open for it. If you think it, then it's more likely to happen. Everyone is created, every single one of us. Do not tell yourself you're not. Success is as scary as failure. You're the average of the five people you hang around with. Hang around with better people. Health and opportunity can't be recycled. Don't, don't fritter your health away. It's a 50-year-old bloke with dodgy knees. <laughs> Being scared is the worst reason of not, for not doing something. Believe in something bigger than you. With power comes responsibility. Smile is free. And no, if you smile, people smile back. You all are now, look. <laughs> and if I yawn, you'll all be yawn. <laughs> and dance. Fucking dance. <laughs> dance. <laughs> no. Thank you.